Hi there. Welcome to the Health Analytic Insights Podcast. This podcast is all about creating a community of like-minded individuals who are passionate about the field of health informatics. I hope to share information and advice in topics such as health analytics, digital health, biomedical engineering, and data visualization in healthcare. And in exchange, I would love to hear from you, dear listener, about your experience and interest in this field. You can drop me a line at healthanalyticinsights at gmail.com. And this email, along with any references discussed during this podcast, will be listed in the show notes below. If this resonates with you, don't forget to follow and subscribe to this podcast, as I'll be releasing new episodes bi-weekly. Before I jump into the episode, I wanted to let you know that at the end of the year, I'll be wrapping up the Health Analytic Insights podcast. I've had so much fun interacting with you, the listener, over the last three years and receiving emails and comments on how these podcast episodes have helped you to learn more about the health informatics field. If you have any episode topics you'd like me to cover before the podcast wraps, please email me at healthanalyticinsights at gmail.com. Now, back to the episode. So I had the honor of interviewing Ron Beleno and Daniel Yeboa. Ron Beleno is an active advocate for dementia, caregiving, aging, and research communities. In his podcast episode, we talked about how technology could be used as a tool to help with the concept of aging in place and the importance of patient advisory groups when driving health technology. Daniel Yeboa is the founder and general manager of Alerca Health Corp. His company is all about digital health, patient care delivery, and we also had a chance to delve into his business model as well, too. What I found from both of these podcast episodes was an emphasis and a focus on the patient. So not the digital tool, not the fancy technology, but how can we center the patient in whatever we're building? And that was really a sentiment that was taught to me throughout all these podcast episodes. We really have to focus on the audience that we're building these products for and not just on the technology itself. So it's really great to hear from them, their own perspectives and ideas when it came to how the technology can work with a patient and not the other way. Can you talk a bit more about what age tech is? So age tech, we'll start with the, the second half of that, that word there, or with tech, you know, it's technology. Okay? And for me, I always try to simplify because technology for a community, for many, it's a sexy word. They get excited. They said, cool, it's it's something neat. Okay. And then there are those that, you know, I've done presentations to many communities, especially caregivers and older adults and those living with dementia. And some of them, it, it happens to be a talk on technology, technology that can help you in your life that when I'm presenting, some of them right away, this is, oh, how do, I'm just here because you know, my wife brought me here and I'm really not into tech. You know, I'm not really interested in this. And I said, oh, you don't have to be, right? I'm not here to tell people, you know, that you have to have technology. Okay? But I actually tell them, re- reframe it and don't look at the word technology. It's simply a tool. Okay? Right, right. It's just a tool to accomplish something or to go to overcome a challenge, a barrier. Okay? So that's when I hear the term tech, I always say you can just simply replace it with tool. Okay? Mm-hmm. And technology could be low tech. It doesn't have to be something that needs to be plugged in, okay, wired. A bat- it needs batteries, that it has lights and buttons, okay. To me, the plumbing system is technology at one point. That's just like the internet to me. It delivers things and gets rid of things or goes back and forth. So that's a tech piece. Age just happens to be the audience that we're, we're dealing with, okay. And age doesn't mean old necessarily, okay. I'll- Your work as a clinician, and I'm wondering, what are some of the biggest gaps that you've noticed um, across your career in healthcare, and how do you see technology really impacting this and making a difference? Um, you know, I think so. When we know when it when it comes to what are what are some of the biggest gaps, I think you know th- there's the cliche that healthcare is broken, right? Um, and so I'd I'd come back to the healthcare system is not broken; um, it's the delivery model that is broken. And, and so we, we have to focus on actually providing care 
to individuals and not servicing, you know, what, what, what I call these episodic issues, right? And so when we look at healthcare, it's, it, the, the, the word is caring for someone's health. Um, and, and when you look at the existing healthcare model, what we look at is, you know, I hurt myself, I need this to be fixed. I've done X and this is what needs to be done, right? And so even our interactions that we have with our physicians are episodic in nature um, and not continuous. And so recognizing that that's where the gap was is taking the experience that I had from a clinical perspective and recognizing that continuous care models is the actual route that we should be going Mm-hmm. where we form a relationship with an individual over a period of time. And that relationship over a, over, a, over a period of time also acts as a preventative method, right? Mm-hmm. When you when you look at chronic diseases, a lot of the a lot of the issues around chronic disease management is really bec- the foundations of it are based on lifestyle. Um, lifestyle and behavior. And so when we have the the right inputs, the right resources, uh, the right supports in place to ha- help us make the better or better lifestyle decisions, mm-hmm. based on behavior, we actually achieve better healthy outcomes, right? And so mm-hmm. as we f- begin to focus on healthy outcomes, not fixing an issue that happened today, right? Mm-hmm. Not, I have a cough, so I need to go see the doctor. But what are some of the things that I'm doing in my life that brought on that cough, right? Mm-hmm. Not now on recognizing that we people will get sick. And so we, we're, we're not going to live in a world where we're absent of illness, but there's definitely things that we can and should be doing that we are not doing that contribute to us, us having an, an unhealthy outcomes. And so, you know, for, for me, it was, what can what can be done differently? How do you deliver care differently to actually provide positive, healthy outcomes to the individuals that we serve? So switching gears a bit, I graduated from university and I found it quite difficult to get that first entry level job. It was very much a chicken and egg situation. And maybe you're going through this right now, or maybe you've gone through it in the past. You see job postings that require experience that are entry level. And so You need experience to get the job, but the job requires experience. And it can really leave you feeling quite defeated and depleted. And then you go on LinkedIn and you see people who have progressed so far in their career, and you really are at a loss to understand how individuals can get from A to B. You see people who are in CEOs and director levels, and you really want to understand their path. And so that's the reason why I really started this podcast to collect stories from individuals who are mid-level in their careers and really understand the path that they are moving along so we can inspire others as well too. So I want to share some clips from Jennifer Lewis, who works as a senior nurse manager in nursing informatics. Jennifer has a YouTube channel called The Informatics Life, which hosts a wealth of information specifically on nursing informatics as well as health informatics directly from her years of experience. And on this episode, we talked about how to break into the field and what technical and soft skills would be best suited for a role in nursing informatics. I'm also gonna share a clip from Patrick Hawley, who is an experienced health information technology professional with a background in data analytics. He also has his own organization, healthit.academy, where he provides top-notch accredited online health IT courses to help individuals pursue a successful career in health informatics. And in this podcast episode, we talked about his career progression in health informatics from his first internship to his current position where he worked primarily with EHR systems. And Patrick provides some really great tips for individuals looking to break into the field. So Jennifer, can you just tell the listeners a bit about yourself? Sure. I have been in the nursing field for over, going on 16 years now, and I, I embarked on this journey about eight years, on, eight years ago, getting into nursing informatics. So I was a bedside nurse for about nine years at a particular hospital, and 
And I, I actually never heard of the field. <laughs> I never even heard of anything, mm -hmm. but I was just the tech person on the floor. Like mm -hmm. anytime someone needed extra help on documentation or they needed the VCR fix. Yes, I'm dating myself. They have, we had VCRs <laughs> back in the day and they were like, Hey Jen, you'll help out or any other type of tech technical thing. I was the go-to person. So I do have a love for technology, of course. That's why I'm in the field. So uh, I transitioned, like I said, about eight years ago into nursing informatics. I was like, totally didn't know anything about it. But I, it, one thing about informatics, they do teach you a lot because everyone has different systems. My name is Patrick Holly. First question is, how did you get into health informatics? Since I was young, I've always been into computers and technology in general. I've always been about innovating and just trying to find new technologies and ways of doing things. So when I got into college, I always wanted to be like IT or something in computers. So at the time, I wasn't as great at math. I noticed that IT was a field that I could get into, didn't have to know much about math, but I could also bring my computer skills along with me to kind of help me out and navigate through my career. I went to a few different schools. I went to Florida State University undergrad. While I was at Florida State, I took IT as my major, but it also had a concentration towards health informatics. So I was able to get the broad introduction to IT and technology and how information and technology merge. And then also I was able to get the experience in healthcare and understanding what the issues are in healthcare and how technology can help improve those problems. So I, I thought it was really cool. And I think around the time I was in undergrad in the U.S., President Obama was just getting in, into office and he did a lot of stuff with health IT or, or healthcare, healthcare insurance, right? So a lot of the healthcare insurance was about digitizing healthcare records. And that's where I kind of fit in. So I saw this big push towards health IT and just digitizing healthcare. And I thought, wow, this would be something real cool. And while I was picking my major, I noticed that it did have this health informatics. I think I went home and studied it a little bit and I was like, I'm going to take this. And it's funny because I always tell people one of the reasons that I really got into it was because health informatics had one of the smallest course loads. So when I said course loads, when it came to like the main courses within health IT, I think there was only two courses that were dedicated towards health IT. And of course, as a college student, you don't really want to do much. But I also saw this as a benefit because I was in the IT undergrad. So that also let me try out different things within the IT field, but not necessarily just be strictly health IT. So I was able to try networking, security, web development. I was also able to try out help desk, which having that hands-on experience or being introduced to that information really helped me understand how I could be of value to the, any organization that hired, whether it be an IT organization or a organization that deals with healthcare data, whatever it may be. So that's pretty much how I got into the field. So as I wrap up this podcast, I want to leave you with some amazing career advice that you can use throughout your career in the health informatics field from my two amazing guests. Asa Spears has her background in biostatistics and is the founder of Rose Data Studio, a data literacy and storytelling consulting agency. In that podcast episode, we talked about the importance of people with a variety of diverse backgrounds entering the analytics field, especially in public health and health informatics. Asia also provided some amazing career advice for those who are interested in breaking into the field. We also got to hear from Anastasia Pargolsky, who emailed me about her challenges of breaking into the health informatics field. In this podcast episode, she recalls her journey of struggling to break into the field to obtaining her first role in health informatics. That episode was jam-packed with helpful advice that you want to hear if you're looking to get to your first role in health informatics and progressing your career in the future as well. It is it's something that I'm really excited about, especially because 
God, this big data universe just keeps expanding. And so I've been around it for about 10 years at this point. But Mm -hmm. if you're just getting into it, I can imagine how it might feel. Um, Very overwhelming. Yeah. (laughs) Like they're telling you, learn R, learn Python, learn SAS, learn Tableau. Mm -hmm. It's like I have other things to do with my life. I can't just be learning (laughs) all these tools. But it's as you're saying, like just try and understand the first step, just like the the language, kind of the data speak like. And um, there's so many resources, I think, that can demystify things. But I think just don't get stuck almost with all this overwhelming messaging that, you know, kind of is pushed out that you have to be perfect in everything. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. I just help people navigate that. And so I think, too, now having the experience of going out and working, like having to upskill and learn SQL for my first job that I had after I, I started my leave of absence and also realizing like, they hired an experienced programmer to write like the first iteration of the dashboard data pool. They did not hire me to do that. <laughs> like They knew the level of talent and experience that they needed. And when they're hiring for junior or senior versus lead versus they know generally kind of what they're looking for. I would say most teams know that. And so that's another thing I, I would say that people can kind of understand what that learning curve could look like. They've hired other people onto the team prior to you, unless it's a brand new team, which at that point you might as you know, you probably have the experience of building your own things from scratch at mm-hmm. that point. But if you're not at that, that point yet, if you're familiar, maybe you've taken a SAS class and then you added a few R modules to transition into that space and you're still kind of pulling all those pieces together. And I think there's enough roles out there for people at that level, as well as Mm -hmm. people who have had deeper experience and more involved with different, you know, aspects of data analysis and kind of pulling their own data versus not. I think there's so many kind of fun components where it's like you take away one thing or add another and you kind of get this picture of what's your profile. And then I'd say the last thing I'd say about that is too, once you put a whole data team together, it's, it kind of creates this beautiful mosaic. And I got to see that on mm. my team where we had one person who had programmed in SAS probably since I was born, which is kind wow. of ridiculous. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> so, I mean, he knew so many things like the back of his hand and he had been in the healthcare space that entire time. So he knew Mm -hmm. about the different EMRs and all. It was incredible. We had someone else who was trained similarly to me with research methods, but then had gone on to in kind of an enterprise data environment a little longer than I had. So his SQL skills were even stronger. He understood the database connections even better. And he had been in a situation where the environment was just really slow and inefficient. So he was really good at writing efficient code. I was like, Mm. wow, that's pretty incredible. Mm. I had the depth of statistical training. And then we had someone else who had a background in medical coding. And so she would ask questions that I was like, how did you even look at the, like that table and know to even ask this? Because she had been on the other side of the data input from, you know, collection in the doctor's office. And I mean, when you put a team like that together, I I call it Fantastic Four. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was incredible. (laughs) It was wonderful. And so I would say it's, again, it's, it's beyond just the data skills. It's beyond Mm -hmm. how quickly and without error your code kind of runs through. It's about how, how do you all approach a problem Mm -hmm. and even expand the work that you're doing into new territory? How do you rely on each other? How do you check each other's code and have each other's back when it comes to those late nights (laughs) right before Mm -hmm. all the reports are due. And I think we built really great camaraderie. And so I think the the other kind of advice that I always try to offer and remind people is that you're going to be on a team, right? And so there's, there's that aspect too of getting to know and figure out how you can partner with your own team members, as well as those who you'll serve with reporting or dashboard or models, whatever your output or products look like. For for me, it was a very difficult process. So I'm wondering if you had a similar experience or completely. Oh different. man! Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, I worked in nonprofit healthcare 
administration type role. So my specialty when I first started my career was healthcare quality improvement. So that was mm-hmm. helping hospitals by and large improve their Medicare, Medicaid metrics they're reporting out on or just any other performance metrics that ultimately resulted in them being penalized by through reimbursement or reduction in reimbursement, whether that's commercial or Medicare, Medicaid. So that was really my area of specialty for the last five years. And during that time, the company that I was with, they actually had a health informatics department that I had tried so many times to get into. And I just I couldn't get in. They said I didn't have enough experience. So in 2020, I put my foot down, I made the decision, I'm going to go back to school. So that way they can't say I don't have enough experience. So I did that. And lo and behold, come July of 2021, through my what's two and a half semesters of school and training and access to resources, I was finally able to land my first contract opportunity with a post-acute care software company. And that has gone very well for me. I started in July. It Mm -hmm. is now November. Mm -hmm. And I am now already transitioning into a full-time role with that company. So my, my journey in getting there was, you know, one, having my own hunger. I was constantly researching the different trends and emerging topics in healthcare informatics, health information technologies, such as FHIR, how blockchain technology is uh, implemented in healthcare, artificial intelligence, things like that. That's just my own personal study that I've been doing over the years as I tried unsuccessfully to interview for a lot of these positions with my old company. And then once I got in school, not only did I learn, obviously, from my coursework, my school also offered courses through LinkedIn Learning. So I took that opportunity there and it's free because LinkedIn Learning is for a premium fee. I think it's about $40 a month, but my school offers it for free. And there I added on to that by studying Agile and the software development lifestyle process, product management, as well as project management. So in my former role, I had tons of experience in structural organization, strategy, corporate, business, strategic, all kinds of stuff like that, but I didn't have that technical piece. So what my school afforded me, not only through the coursework, but also through the extra resources that it provided, was that experience that I was lacking, and I was able to combine my applied experience through my five years as a program manager with Mm -hmm. some of my coursework learning to land this opportunity. So that's a wrap on the podcast. Not only have I had such an amazing time interacting with you, the audience, through emails, YouTube comments, and much more, I've had an amazing time interviewing these guests. And these are just a subset of the amazing people that I've had an opportunity to interview, who I'm so grateful came on the podcast and shared their wisdom. If you want to get a hold of me, you can always reach me at healthanalyticinsights at gmail.com. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to this podcast.